Um, in just allowing your eyes to close gently, if you're comfortable with that. Otherwise, just lowering your gaze, letting your eyes soften a bit, looking towards something that's nearby. And really just starting by bringing attention into the areas of contact that your feet are having with the floor. Just feeling into your feet and noticing how solid the ground is under your feet. Maybe feeling where your shoes or your socks or your slippers are in contact with your feet. Just sensing your feet being encased. And now moving on to the thighs, the backs of your legs, and your bottom, and no noticing where they have contact with the chair. And just allowing the ground, the surface that you're on, allowing the chair to hold and support your body without you needing to do anything at all. And now moving the attention to your back. Where does your back touch the back of the chair? There's no right or wrong, no place where it should be touching. Just notice where it is touching. And are you able to feel the difference between where there's contact and where there's none? And now moving the attention to your hands, really feeling into your hands, maybe noticing the position of your hands. Noticing what they're touching. Perhaps touching the chair or your thighs, or maybe the other hand. And an interesting question you can ask yourself is, how do I know I have hands without looking? You just know, right? We can feel the hands from within us. And now opening your awareness even more, feeling your entire body sitting here in this moment on this chair. And now bringing the attention to the breath. If you like, you can make the next couple of breaths a little bit deeper so you can really feel the breath. Maybe taking those deep belly breaths or if that's not an option, just breathing deeply from your chest. Perhaps asking yourself, where you feel the breath the most? Where the sensations of breathing are the most pleasant? 
maybe at the nostrils where the air comes in, maybe at the back of your throat, in your chest, maybe it's in the belly. And using that place as the anchor for your attention. This is where you come back to over and over whenever the mind wanders off, as we know it will in meditation. Just using that place where the breath is most pleasant as your anchor. And now letting the breath just breathe itself. No need to make it any other way than it wants to be. Our body holds so much wisdom, it knows how to breathe. The best way to nourish the body with oxygen. So just let it be natural. And when you notice your attention is somewhere else, just gently bring it back to the breath. And as we finish this grounding meditation, just congratulate yourselves for taking the time this morning to care for yourself, to nourish mind, body, and spirit. No need to go anywhere or do anything. It's a time to Simply be with yourself. And when I ring the, the bells, so just simply come back to an awareness of your surroundings and gently open your eyes. So when you're back, and of course, take your time coming back to awareness, continue to sit with your eyes closed if you would like to do that. Just take, take care to do what you need for yourself this morning. Um, and I will uh, kind of launch into something that we did talk about uh, very briefly last week, and I would love your input um, on this, but what um, I'm referring to is the influence of culture on emotion. Um, you know, as, as we are aware, um, you know, the, the culture in which we live and in which we grew up 
provides the structure, provides the guidelines and the expectations um, to, to help us understand and interpret and express various emotions, including anger. Um, and, you know, we were taught from a very young age um, what kind of an emotional dis display is considered acceptable um, by the culture that we're living in. Um, and, you know, even, not even how um, strong emotions like anger are displayed, but how they're experienced. Um, you know, there's, um, there's a lot of guidance in the way that uh, people respond to us that tells us whether this is an acceptable way to experience a strong emotion um, and to express a strong emotion. Does that make sense? The difference between the experience and the expression of the emotion. And that's something that we learned from a very, very early age. Um, so um, I don't know if anyone has any, any examples. I, uh, Josetta mentioned a bit last week about um, uh, her family and um, how the differences between her family and her husband's um, family were. Um, anybody, or Josetta, if you want to expound on that, um, you know, how that the cultural upbringing that we have actually um, allows us to experience emotions either in a positive or a negative fashion the experience and then the expression of them. I will tell you, I'll start. Um, I grew up in a um, very German family and um, the uh, German culture is very stoic. Um, so strong emotion is not something that is um, uh, really expressed in, in the German culture. So um, I uh, have really had to relearn as an adult how to show emotion because everything in my world as a child was just stable, steady from the outside. You know, the interior world was very different um, however, on the outside, it looked like everything was just nice and smooth and even as we did not express strong emotion. So that was kind of my, um, um, my experience as a child. And then um, when I met my husband and we eventually got married, uh, he is Ukrainian, 100% Ukrainian. And his family, oh my God goodness, I thought they were arguing all the time <laughs> because the, the way that they express, I mean, just through conversation. And of course, I couldn't understand most of what they were saying because they spoke in mostly Ukrainian. Um, and I honestly, I thought they were arguing all the time. And my husband said, no, no, we're just, we're just talking. <laughs> So it's that intonation that makes such a huge difference. Yes. And I never even thought about that until I was with his family. Josetta, yeah. Well, what I learned then is, okay, we had the opposite in our family. And that's the same words my husband used. Oh, my gosh. At the dinner table, like we were fighting. I was like, no, we're not fighting. We're just same thing your husband said to you. Anyway, um, but what I learned was even any emotion wasn't to be expressed, excitement and joyfulness. But what I learned as I was trying to be different, to be, to tap this all down is that once we, once I started to regulate that, then I lost all emotions. So joy, if, you, if sadness isn't expressed, joy isn't expressed. If joyfulness isn't expressed and sad, sad. I mean, it's just like, it, it's, it was this huge thing that I didn't know what was going on. 
except that I knew that I didn't really like what was happening to me. Because what happens really is when I suppress my emotions, I'm not saying that we can't regulate them, that's different. Um, it causes depression, that's what depression is. It's a depressed stopping what's happening in us, but there are appropriate ways to be able to express what's going on within us also. But some of the cultural things is, some of those are not right or wrong. They just are. And that's where we have to all learn to, to learn to be open to the different ways that different people are. We're all different. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, a couple of points that um, came up in my mind as you were talking is, um, first of all, there's probably a reason why certain cultures have developed certain characteristics in terms of experiencing and expressing their emotions. Um, so, you know, recognizing that there's a story behind that and respecting, you know, what, what that story might be. Um, and the other thing you mentioned depression, you know, when we suppress our emotions, um, through the readings that I've been doing on, on anger, that is exactly what happens when we suppress what we're actually doing. We're not, we're not um, doing away with the emotion. We're internalizing the emotion. And what ends up happening is it turns kind of against us. And that, um, that can be expressed in either depression or you know other emotional maladies or it can be it can turn into aggression you know outward aggression so suppressing it does one of two things it internalizes or it externalizes and either way is not necessarily healthy for our, our overall well-being so Thank you for bringing that up. It reminded me of some of my readings. Anybody else? I mean, there's no, no pressure, no pressure to share. I <laughs> found, um, uh, you know, we know that different cultures um, are different um, in the way that they express things, but it, it, when it really gets down to it, it becomes even more fascinating. And I think that's why it's important to be able to talk about things like that. When um, one of our daughters-in-law joined the family and we were with her family, their family, um, and I noticed that with our little granddaughter when, when she was as tiny as she was, whenever there is a group of people, you know, you're in the living room or you're in a gathering with, you know, five or six people and you're all talking, they address one another by name always, always when they're talking to someone. And so we were, there was this conversation, we were sitting around and I, I, I was part of the conversation, but I wasn't named to be part of the conversation. And then I was told, I'm talking to so-and-so, I'm not talking to you. It was, and so then I realized that they always, they always gave a name of who they were talking to. You didn't have group conversations. It was, the, for me, very strange. But for that family, that's the way their family was. Sure. So it took that adjusting back and forth to be able to come to some kind of a happy medium that, you know, because I was just shocked, like, you know, coming from an Italian family and then having somebody say, you're not part of the conversation when you're sitting together for 40 minutes <laughs> all together, you know, like around the table at dinner time and you're not all part of the conversation. I, that was like beyond what I could understand. I didn't understand it till I was kind of, I was really reprimanded is what happened during that time. And mm -hmm. so then later got to learn what it was all about. So, but it's just part of what is, and we all have to learn how to communicate to be able to get along because it's not right or it's not wrong. It's different. And it's like crayons, you know, red isn't better than blue and green isn't better than yellow. And we need all of them 
in order to make a beautiful photo or picture painting, right? Oh, I love that. Yeah. That's a great analogy. Yeah, it's so, so true. Um, and these things are so subtle. Um, you know, it really takes awareness, which kind of reckons back to mindfulness, um, awareness of um, uh, the subtleties of communication. So, you know, noticing, and, and sometimes they do need to be point, pointed out to us because they are so subtle. Um, I know that um, when we've traveled, particularly in, um, in France, um, French people um, think that when you're, you're smiling, um, you know, just maybe walking down the street, enjoying the views or whatever, they think that there's something wrong with you mentally. Um, <laughs> I actually had it explained to me that um, they think that people who are smiling just randomly are idiotic. Um, and that's a cultural thing. Whereas in, in our country, you know, smiling is viewed as something, oh, that look at that person, they're enjoying their day, they're happy, you know, whatever. But in France, we look like idiots. <laughs> so, um, and it's, it's been very interesting to me to, to learn um, how in, in Europe, they can immediately spot an American. And some of it is what we're wearing. Um, but much of it is our um, demeanor, mm -hmm. our expression, our facial expressions, that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. it's just, it's fascinating when you, you really get down to it. Um, one thing that I ran across that um, I thought was very, very interesting I wanted to share with you is that there are certain basic facial expressions of emotion that are universal. It has nothing to do with culture or, or upbringing or anything like that. And research has actually discovered seven basic types of emotions that are expressed in our faces. So those seven emotions are sadness, happiness, disgust, surprise, anger, contempt, and fear. Um, so th those are the basic emotions. I even have, I don't know if you'll be able to see it. I wish I had made a screenshot of it and then I could have shared it with you, but they show these faces, can you see that? Those are the, it's kind of dark, but what those are mean? the facial expressions that are universal. Mm -hmm. um, and it goes on to say that there are other um, emotions such as um, uh, jealousy, love, pride, those are different from these basic emotions and they're more likely to be dependent on cultural influences than are the more basic emotions, okay? And fascinating is to me. Could you read the list of the ones that are not the same? Just out of curiosity. The it? ones that are not the same? Yeah. Jealousy, Okay. love, Pride. Those are the examples that they gave. Okay. Um, Thank you. I don't know. I don't know if we can. I'm sure we could probably brainstorm and think of some other ones too. Um, where is. Um, the. Um, uh, those emotional, those facial expressions. Interestingly, even congenitally blind individuals, so people who are born blind, produce the same facial expressions associated with those emotions, despite never having observed them in other people. Isn't that fascinating? 
So that just says, it says a lot about emotion to me, not just the universality of its expression, but a lot about emotion. So um, yes, good, fascinating, fascinating stuff. Um, and some of the um, examples um, of like something that's called a cultural display rule. It dictates the type and the frequencies of emotional displays that are considered acceptable within a certain culture. Um, for example, in many Asian cultures, social harmony is prioritized over individual gain. Whereas in Europe and in the United States, individual self-promotion is largely prioritized. Would you agree with that? Yeah, we are much more about the individual than we are about social harmony. Um, and research has shown that individuals from the US are more likely to express negative emotions, such as fear, anger, disgust, both alone and in the presence of others. While Japanese individuals are more likely to do so only while alone, never in the presence of others. So, um, yeah, I mean, there are lots and lots of, of different examples. Another one that I read about was um, uh, in, um, oh shoot, I can't remember which culture it was. Um, one of them um, was, well, in the, in the US, we um, want people to look us in the eye when we're mm -hmm. talking. Right. And in other another culture, and I'm sure there are many different cultures, looking someone in the eye is considered challenging and is um, uh, actually not encouraged during a conversation, particularly with children. It's it's disrespectful for children to look at adults in the eye when they're conversing. Mm. So, yeah, you know, and to Josetta's point, you know, that. Um, that is a subtlety. That is a tremendous subtlety. We would never realize um, that we were being offensive to someone by looking them in the eye. Right? Uh, Jan, is there more depression in Japan since they don't um, use their facial expressions when they're with other people? Well, I, I don't know specifically about that, Darlene. I do know that there is a lot of depression in Japan because their expectations are so high um, for their achievement. Um, and I do know too that the um, Japanese culture, and I'm speaking in generalities here, but Japanese culture tends to be quite rigid in terms of their rules. Mm -hmm. And I would think that would apply to the expression of emotions too. Yeah. And that is an example of it turning inward. And so I guess in that sense, yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. That probably has a lot to do yeah. with, uh, with the depression rate in Japan. I know that in, in um, Asian countries, suicide has increased dramatically. Ugh. And much of it is the competitiveness um, and I would assume the suppression, you know, of, of emotions, so. Well, what's it like when the husband retires and he's around the house all day? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not even sure they retire in Japan. <laughs> it's a, probably a good thing. Because <laughs> there's so much competition for achievement. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. Josetta, I see your mouth moving, but. I, I was just saying, I wonder if because we've become much more global in the last, especially the last 20 years, 10, 15 years with communication tools and everything else going on, if cultures are 
coming around together more like are the Japanese I know what you were talking about these different things about Japanese people and whether that's changing I was very aware of all of those things like 20 years ago because I was studying those things and a part of it but I don't really know anymore what statistics are or anything like that and I just wondered if if things have changed I don't and I don't know have they changed in the U.S. I it's hard to say for sure because we have groups of people now it seems like and so we have some groups of people that are changing this way and some groups of people that are changing this way and so we're almost getting further apart in some ways because of mm -hmm. that so maybe we're not as homogeneous as we used to be or the culture isn't as strong in a sense as it used to be i i don't know but um what i would like to see if we can talk about a little bit is because of these differences how do we work through them? How do we work to express anger in a way that's, I don't know, want to say the word acceptable because that makes it sound like it's bad, but in a way that's good for all of us, good for me and good for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, those kinds of things, or whatever, yeah. whatever the emotions might be. Um, the, uh, um, you know, much of, much of the, I think, the management of anger and the, the strong emo, all strong emotions, really, um, um, I think kind of, it, it goes back, at least from a mindful standpoint, which is where I'm coming from. Um, it, it sort of goes back to, if you recall that stop practice, um, Abraham, did you want to say something? Did no, you I didn't. Want... Yeah, I was in the army as an officer. Uh -huh. And uh, when my children were growing up, we had an atmosphere at the house where properly the children thought that I'm always disciplined, angry. They didn't say that at that time, but subsequently when they grew up, you now they're married, settled down. Now, one by one, they said that you are very strict and very, ang very angry at times. So that was because of the army background, possibly I was trying to be very strict and disciplined, but they thought that I was angry with them. Ah. That's but in, in the, it was not, it was only a disciplined life because of my background as an army officer. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's kind of what I'm talking about. kind of a misinterpretation. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, the stop practice, if you recall me talking about that stop practice from a mindful standpoint, um, which is when, when we feel, first of all, um, we mindfully want to become aware that we are angry or that we are building up to anger. Um, and that is so much of the, the meditations that we do when we talk about particularly the, um, the physiological sensations. You know, when I talk about body awareness and um, noticing where your breath is coming from, um, noticing any tight areas in your body, um, noticing whether your jaw is relaxed or clenched or whatever. The reason for all of that in meditation is to become aware of how what your, your normal state of being is, okay? Um, to become aware of what it feels like to be relaxed so that when you become stressed, when you start to become angry, or even when you're joyful and happy or whatever, you notice the difference. It all comes down to awareness. That is the fundamental thing about mindfulness. Um, being aware of our normal state of being, um, or perhaps I should say, our, um, the state of being that we aspire to. Okay, and then um, being able to pay attention to what is going on in our emotions, our thoughts, and our body sensations. 
this is it right here, this triangle of awareness, thoughts, emotions, body sensations. So once we have that awareness, which we can really gain through, um, through meditation, through the body scans, um, you know, I, I'm sure there are many, many other ways um, to approach it, but we, um, and, you know, really I'm getting into kind of the, the mindfulness-based stress reduction course um, that, it, that is eight weeks of learning all of these things, not only the, the physical sensations in our bodies, but also um, being able to bring awareness to what we're thinking, bring awareness to what we're feeling, what our emotions are at any given moment. That's the key. That's where it all starts. So um, once we have awareness, there is a technique that is called STOP, and I think I've mentioned it before. Um, the acronym uh, S is for literally stop. When you, you've noticed, okay, you're aware, your body is tensing up, your thoughts are kind of becoming disengaged from, last week we talked about that rational, uh, logical executive functioning. When we get angry, when their strong emotion, we're starting to become disengaged from that executive function. You notice that in your thoughts and in your emotions, you know, obviously you're starting to feel anger. Um, so stop, take a breath is the T part of stop. So we're engaging that breathing that we learn in meditation. You know, okay, we're gonna take a deep breath maybe even sensing this is gonna bring us into the present moment, sensing where is the breath, where do I feel it the most? Um, and then moving on to the O, which is really the big part, observe. Observe what is happening. Okay, this is where you pay attention to that, that triangle of awareness, thoughts, emotions, body sensations. What is, what's going on here? And um, we, we talked last week about is, is this anger my friend or is it my enemy? So this is where we can determine um, is, is this something that I want to address? And that's really where the P comes in, proceed or pause. So proceed with my anger because perhaps my anger is a friend right now. I'm going to protect someone with my anger or I'm going to protect myself with my anger or am I going to pause? Because maybe in, in that observation phase of this stop practice, we recognize um, perhaps this is a cultural difference. Perhaps this is something that um, I have, uh, that there are deeper, deeper meanings to this, you know, that sort of thing. Now, can we do this, um, you know, in the blink of an eye? Uh, no, we can't. So that's where the practice part comes in. Um, and all of the classes that I teach, they get so sick of hearing me say practice practice, practice. Once we practice these things, it becomes habitual. And then we don't have to think about it so much. Um, but, you know, in the beginning, when we're learning things like this stop practice, um, it's, it's okay to say, um, you know, I, I need to remove myself from this situation for a moment. Um, we'll come back to this, you know, that kind of thing, so that you can move away and go through the process, go through the S, the T, the O, and the P. Um, and um, then you, you would find as you practice more and more and more, it becomes habitual and you don't even have to really think about it too much anymore. Uh, so I, does that help at all, Josetta, in what you were wondering? Does it? Yeah, that was huge. That's great help. Thank you. 
Okay. Yeah. And I've, it's interesting that you were talking about mindfulness because I've learned since I did that extensive mindfulness class, that's 10 years ago now, that I've noticed a huge difference in myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that I don't see it now. And, you know, and like, I, it really, a lot of it wasn't, it wasn't really anger. It was other emotions that were messed it's masqueraded to come out as expressed in a way as anger because we didn't know I didn't didn't know another way to express them or how to deal with them or whatever it might be. Sure. And I'm usually going to say it's lack of control or fear without knowing when I say fear this God, you know, and it's 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 small, it's like not a um, mammoth sort of a fear somebody's gonna be drowning or something like that. I mean everyday sorts of things of not knowing what's going to happen with whatever the situation is of someone or something like that. You know, usually it's a family member, close family member, and that's what causes the anxiety is because of, um, I'm, I'm even going to say if someone starts to get ill, like your son now, and then there's a fear that sometimes can start to come up with, oh my gosh, I hope he's going to be okay and all of that. And then it ends up being expressed inappropriately as anger with something else triggers it. And then as you Absolutely. said, it comes out. So that, that's kind of what mindfulness is sort of helped temper. Mm -hmm. things. Yeah, and you know, when we look at the stop practice in, yeah. in relation to that example that you just gave, um, if we're able to use the, the O part of that and observe, okay, is, you know, I think the greatest question is, is this anger my friend or my enemy? And that I think allows us to, to dive a little bit deeper into, okay, is there something else going on here for me? You know, am I, am I scared? Am I frustrated? Because remember we said, anger is always a secondary emotion. So in that observe phase of stop, we can think, is there, what emotion is underlying yeah. all of this? Um, because there is always going to be an emotion underlying it. Um, and here's some food for thought. Um, I do have a final meditation, um, but oh, I have so much more I wanted to talk about. Um, some food for thought is in the uh, stress reduction class, um, the, stress is taught really as a manifestation of feeling out of control. So think about the times that you experience stress um, and just notice, am I feeling out of control? What am I wishing I could control right now? It doesn't solve necessarily anything. However, once, once again, it's that awareness piece. Once we become aware of what we feel out of control about, it is very helpful for us in managing our emotion about it. So just, just think about that as, um, uh, as your week goes on. Stress is really a manifestation of feeling out of control. Um, so any, any questions, comments? I had this beautiful article. Um, maybe we'll get around to it um, another time about, you know, how emotional experiences, we, we have to be willing to experience emotion, um, which we, we did touch on already, um, you know, about the suppression of emotions. But um, the author of this particular article says, we have to be willing to get our hands dirty with disturbing emotions. I love that phrase, get our hands dirty with disturbing emotions. Um, so maybe we'll get around to that another, another time. Um, so, um, Let's see, you ready for a, a final meditation? Does that sound good? Okay. All righty.
So this is um, this is actually a um, practice for opening up to difficult emotions. Um, and there may be a part in here, um, you know, where you're asked to recall a difficult emotion. Um, so, you know, I don't want to bring up any, um, any thing that is going to leave you with um, anger or fear or frustration or, you know, any of those, those feelings. So, um, in when there is a, a question about a, a recent event, something moderate, you know, relatively minor. Okay, try not to go to a really dramatic example. Okay. Um, thank you, Josetta. Thank you, thank you. That's for later. Okay. Two antibody. Okay, great. Um, so let's just take a few deep, you know, really conscious breaths, really consciously paying attention to your breath. Closing your eyes whenever you're ready or lowering your gaze. And just thinking as you're taking these deep breaths about the thoughts, the emotions, the sensations that are within you right now in this present moment. Just anything that's coming up for you within the breath and in the body. It's kind of a, a quick inventory of how you're doing right now. Without judgment, there's no way that you should feel or you need to feel. Just the way that you do feel. The way that you are thinking. The way that your body is at this moment. And let's really start with a relaxation practice to begin. So taking a long, slow breath in, and we're gonna take a gentle, even longer breath out. So taking a long, slow breath in, and a gentle, even longer breath out. Really resting your attention with the breath, bringing yourself into the present moment with the breath. And to really bring our bodies into um, relaxation Try on your next in-breath to breathe in for a count of four. Hold your breath for a count of seven. And then release your breath for a count of eight. So we're doing a four, seven, eight cycle here. So on the in-breath, we breathe in for four counts. We hold for seven and then we release for eight. Inhale for four, hold for seven, exhale for eight. And one more time. Inhale for four, hold for seven, exhale for eight.
And what that particular breath does is it actually engages the parasympathetic nervous system in our bodies, which creates a relaxation response. So it's a physiological answer to stress in our bodies. And now just settling into a natural rhythm of breathing as best you can. And maintaining kind of an awareness of the quality of your breath, the in and out. And now gently calling to mind, if you will, your desire and the will you have inside yourself for peace, for peace that begins with you, for well-being that begins right here, right now, in your own body, in your own being and spirit. And perhaps on, on the next inhalation, consciously focus on the love and compassion that exists in your own heart. The peace that can begin with you right now, extending through you right now. And as you breathe in, bringing greater awareness to this love this warm, loving softness within you. Or perhaps other characteristics that you sense, other ways you describe your own warming heart and the will in your heart, the will for, for justice, for for love, for kindness in, in the global community, in the social community, in the family community. And if you're able, allowing yourself to completely feel the compassion in your being for everyone who's suffering, obviously in a way that includes you. It includes all of us. And as much as possible, allowing yourself to completely feel the compassion in your being for everyone who's suffering particularly those who are suffering the most in your community, in your family, in the world right now, wherever they may be. So as you breathe in and out, breathing in the sense of awareness of the love in your heart and breathing out very consciously, sending loving support toward all those you believe to be in need of it in this very moment. Breathing in a sense of your own loving heart and what is well within you. And while breathing out, gently extending the wish for well being from your own head down to your toes and flowing out through you to the communities you meet and touch and out as far as your reach can go, circling the globe. And as we bring this meditation gently to a close, just taking a moment to appreciate all that you are, all that you do, the body that's carrying you through this very life 
in all its perfect imperfection, just as you are. Perhaps calling forth an intention for, for staying in attunement and holding with grace, your spirit, your being, and your energy for today, tomorrow, and onward. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well in body and in mind. May you be safe from inner and outer dangers. And may you be truly joyful and free. May all of us be safe, well, and truly joyful and free. So I thank all of you. Um, so good to be with you today. And uh, I hope you have a great week. I am going to copy down um, what Josetta sent all of us. I thank you so much, Josetta, for that. I'm going to send this to my son right now. Pray for your son. Oh, thank you, Abraham. Thank you so much. Fortunately, um, his symptoms are relatively mild right now, and we hope they stay that way. Yep. Had, speedy recovery. Uh, he, uh, he hadn't lost his sense of taste, which I understand is a good sign um, that milder cases tend to... Um, uh, they tend not to lose their taste, their sense of taste. So I'm going to believe that. Yeah. And his youth, <laughs> I'm going to choose to believe that. <laughs> and, and his youth is in his favor. Yes. Well, yeah. I mean, he doesn't feel youthful. <laughs> but 39 to me, that's pretty youthful. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, he'll, he'll fight it off. Also, your smell, you're not, you can't smell and you can't taste. That's yeah, he said he can do both. He can still oh. smell and he can still taste. Great. Well, maybe he has something else. No, they tested him. Um, no. They tested him for the flu mm -hmm. um, and he did not have the flu. He had a flu shot, um, mm -hmm. but that doesn't always protect us from the flu. But, no. but it yeah, helped. No, they, yeah, they said it was, they said it was COVID, so um, yeah, we'll see. But I thank all of you for your kindness. Mm -hmm. So Eli Lilly's. Yeah. The big thing to know is it's a monoclonal antibody. Um, Regeneron's is, is that plus also a second one. They call it the cocktail one. But um, different places give different, different ones. Um, he may not because of his youth and for older people, especially, they'll give it right away without uh -huh. any trouble is what the doctor said. Because he's younger, they may or may not. It'll depend on what's happening with them. And the big thing is, is if he can check his, you know, your oxygen level is what's important because you can be feeling fine and they can drop. And then as this doctor says, you just go right to the emergency. You don't fool around with it. You oh, okay. So, you know, generally the younger people are getting through it. Even older people are getting through it well. None of us know how it's going to be. So, yeah. But we are going to all pray and surround him with healing mm -hmm. energy. Uh, that's so kind. Thank you so much, everybody. It'll really be good. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And all of you stay well. Okay. Take good Take care. care. Stay warm. Yeah. Yes. <laughs>
Thank you. And I'll see right. you on, on see you Monday of next week. <laughs> bye bye. Bye.